If you need us throughout the week, folks, thefinancialguys.com. And uh, I, with no further ado, let's switch right to Dr. Dan Erickson. How are you, sir? Good. We uh, are so very thankful that you are spending some time with us. I know it's uh, you're on the uh, the West Coast there, eleven o'clock, but I'm sure you are crazy busy, and I can't thank you enough. We played your clips uh, for two hours last week, so <laughs> it is uh, it is an honor to have you on, and we really appreciate you again spending some time with us. So, tell everybody a little bit about your background, if you could. Well, uh, if you ask the American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, I'm just some. Um you know, wacko with an opinion. But it sounds like us. <laughs> yeah, I'm just some nutbag. But the bottom line is I was trained as an emergency physician through county, although they don't think that's important. They think I should hide that, in fact. Uh, so I'm trained as an emergency physician. I worked in that industry for years, and then I started building medical businesses about eight years ago. And I have them spread out through Central and Southern California. And uh, somehow I, I did a... A little bit, a little press release from my local media, and it went all over the place. And now I'm having to deal with it. <laughs> well, we we appreciate you quote dealing with it. Let, let me tell. Let me ask you this: I keep hearing "follow the science, follow the science." Now, you guys put out there some science. I thought, well, why are we not following that? Because they're not hyperbole. That's the short answer. Um, you, you figure the, the predictive models we've been following predicted that we were going to have two million people dead in the United States. And that didn't happen. So I said to myself, why don't I just collect my own data, do some testing and see what's really going on, which I did. And I put out raw numbers. They were not biostatistically analyzed. They were raw data. I had done 5,213 tests, 340 positive, 6.5%. And so I put that out there and uh, people got mad because it wasn't peer reviewed. And I said, listen, this thing started two months ago. We don't have double-blind, clinically-controlled trials peer-reviewed to deal with. We have raw data. And I said, if we, look at, if we look at the predictive models, they're not helping us. Telling us that 2 million people are going to die from the top position in the White House isn't helping. So I said, my data is I've tested this many, this many are positive. And they attacked me and said, your data is not randomized. I said, you're right, it's not. This is a new, novel virus. We just started responding to it. We don't have a lot of good data to extrapolate from, so I merely gave my raw data to a couple local news stations, and uh, it was attacked for something it was never meant to be. Well, it seems like anything that's counter to their narrative is being attacked, right? So whether it's hydrochloroquine versus the new drug that uh, Gilead's coming out with or anything, if it, and my understanding of medicine, correct me if I'm wrong, it's your business, not mine. But my understanding was that, you know, you do, you know, some peer review stuff, but that there's different opinions sometimes. There's different treatments for different things, and it's not always automatic consensus, unlike math, where math is math, right? And I think a lot of what you put out there is just simply math. And there's multiple studies, not just the the raw data that you put out there, but there's data that we're getting from New York, from Sweden, from 60 Minutes even, that all kind of corroborate the same numbers, right? Well, if you look at the statement, CDC put out a statement today that said COVID-19 is basically like a severe flu. And so I have been studying Sweden. I've been listening to the epidemiologist and the Dr. Witowski, the great Dr. Witowski, who's a Ph.D. And he has his biostatistics degree, master's. And I said, help us understand what's going on. I am not an expert on this. I would like to know what the experts think. And so we looked at Sweden and we looked at what they're doing and their disease and death rate looked really good. And Dr. Anders Tegnell and Dr. Giseki said, we're very happy with our results and we're so happy we didn't follow the world's example. See, they said, you guys are the guinea pig. You were trying something, this whole lockdown shelter in place that's never been done and it's not proving to be effective. The whole point of the lockdown was to keep the hospitals from overwhelming. And now the hospitals are furloughing doctors. They're shutting down floors, furloughing nurses. We've had to cut our rates. Everybody is losing on this deal, and there's almost no upside from what I can see. Hmm. Um, Tell me about, um, you know, you you mentioned in your press release that, you know, you were worried about people with heart disease and diabetes, right? I mean, all of a sudden now we're not having heart issues in this country. Yeah, well, what's interesting about that is I called 
I called some different ER docs. Uh, I called one gentleman in Wisconsin. I said, tell me about your, he said, I just got off a night shift. I said, tell me about it. He said, well, he said, as you know, uh, you see chest pain, belly pain. And he said, the interesting thing was people's chest pain had started several days prior and they waited. And when this, this ER physician asked them, why did you wait? And they said, I was afraid of COVID. So now they've got these, these worsening conditions these heart attacks, these abdominal issues that should have been dealt with three days ago, but because of COVID, now they have a worse issue to deal with. And we don't have data for that. This is all stuff that I'm hearing when I call ER doctors in different states and I say, what are you seeing? ER doctor in the Bronx. I have all this data if you want it. ER data from the Bronx, I think two days ago said, I just finished a shift over this last week. He said, I've been dealing with COVID for the last couple of months. It was like a war zone. Now it's lifting. The ER is opening up. Beds are opening up. I think it's time to open up the economy. And he's in the middle of the Bronx in a hot zone. Hmm. So time after time after time after time after time, doctors are saying it's time to open things up. We sheltered in place, and we're prepared for a second wave. I talked to the CEOs in Kern County. They said their hospital census is low. I said, are you ready for a secondary surge? They said yes. So now my question is, why are we still on lockdown? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been calling it COVID in a box, where we're just looking at COVID, but we're not looking at anything else. You know, um, you talked a little bit about the pressure to list a death as COVID. Would you comment on that a little bit? Dr. Jensen, a uh, doctor from Minnesota and a senator, will actually fax you over a seven-page document where they said if you are unsure if a patient has COVID and you didn't test them, please list it as COVID. <laughs> wow. We're hearing the same thing in New York, doctor. Yeah. Um, we've, had a, we've got a number of doctors, uh, friends, and nurses that are, are getting equal pressure. That was up until the point that they started to knock uh, Como for so many nursing home deaths, and so now they're actually peeling those off. But anyhow, yeah. um, let me ask you a question on, you know, when it comes to the capacities and, and the ability for, you know, hospitals to take a secondary surge. You know, we were told initially that we had to flatten the curve. And whether you believe that the lockdown worked or it didn't, seemingly the curve was a lot flatter than we expected it because I don't know of any hospitals across the country that were really overwhelmed, right? Now that the curve is flat and they're seemingly moving the goalpost to say, well, we want, you know, less of an infection rate. So let me ask you that specifically on infection rate. How do you track that specifically? They're talking about Germany reopened and they went from a 0.7 to back up to a 1. I mean, Aren't some of these things lagging indicators when it comes to, you know, how they're analyzing and looking at some of these numbers? Well, let's talk about what flattening the curve means. I asked my biostatistician, Ph.D., I've asked two infectious disease epidemiologists, and I've listened to their answers. Their answer is, why would you drag out the course of disease, crush an economy to the tune of two to four trillion for a disease that will reach herd immunity no matter what. The flattening the curve was supposed to make sure the hospitals were not overwhelmed. They're underwhelmed at this point. Right. So why are we delaying the inevitable? We have to get to herd immunity. And the conversation always comes back to herd immunity. That is the key. We get 70 or 80% of the population that has developed an, uh, immunoglobulins, IgG, and they are no longer susceptible and the, and the virus burns out. The disease rate we will not know the exact disease rate of, of, of this thing until we go through the entire cycle. Right now, according to Dr. Witowski, who's analyzing the data, he said it looks like a severe flu. We've lost 62,000. That's about a severe flu compared to 27, 2018. So the death rates day to day aren't as relevant as the entire picture. Dr. Witowski told me, he said viruses move in a very smooth curve through the society typically. You don't have massive spikes usually unless someone finds some cases in a shoebox, as he put it. Hmm. So right. I, think, I think Sweden is our model. I'm super proud of them for standing alone with their 10.3 million people and showing us all how it's done. Hmm. Hey, Dr. Erickson, we got to take a quick break. Would you Could you stick with us for a little bit? Is that okay? Uh, sure. All right. You're, you're awesome. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Real quick break here. Can we like bring this break down like a minute or two that way we can get Dr. back on? All right. Do your best, Frank. All right. Real quick break. Mike Lomas, Glenn Eagle Financial Guys on the live line with us. Dr. Dan Erickson from California, owner of Accelerated Care and an ER physician. We'll be back here on Financial Guys Radio Network.
Forget the extremists. It's simple. No one hunts with an assault rifle. No one needs 10 bullets to kill a deer. You're listening to The Financial Guys, Glenn Wiggle and Mike Lomas. To reach Glenn and Mike now, call 803-0930. Toll free at 800-616-WBEN. And cell calls are free at star 930. All righty, if you're just tuning in, Mike Lomas, Glenn Wiggle, Financial Guys, the place where money meets politics. It's the Financial Guys Radio Network, and on the live line with us, Dr. Uh, Dan Erickson, and Dr. Erickson is uh, owner of Accelerated Care, ER physician out of California, and uh, for those of you that uh, caught us last week, we played uh, the, his, some of his videos uh, throughout the whole show, actually, so a real honor to have him on, and uh, I know he's going to stay with us till the bottom of the hour, so that's awesome. Uh, Dr. Erickson, uh, can, can you just comment and talk a little bit about the, the immune system itself, because I really, really found that part of it incredibly informative, and Weeks ago, now I am not a doctor, I am a financial planner, but I said weeks ago, my concern is everybody wiping everything down and wearing masks, that it's going to hurt their immune system and they're going to get sick from other things. I said that four weeks ago on our podcast, and and when you as a doctor were talking about how the immune system was built, I thought, you know, that more people need to understand that. Well, I think I think this goes back to such basic science and what, what the... What the CDC put out today was basically, you know, we need to go back to basic science. Uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Atlas from Stanford put out a statement today saying we need to go back to our basic understanding of microbiology, which is what I was talking about. The immune system is built when an antigen, which is a fancy word for a virus or bacteria, comes into your body. You form a complex. These, these structures called immunoglobulins, IgG and IgM, form the basis of your immune system and destroy the virus. You only can build an immune system when you're exposed to the antigen. When you go the bubble boy route and you wrap a small child in, in a hamster wheel and let them go, they do not build a strong immune system. So uh, this whole the, that's why I keep going back to herd immunity. Herd immunity is us infecting one another, getting to the peak quick and coming down. Look at China. Look at South Korea. They peaked quick. Why? They did not go on lockdown until two weeks after it was discovered. They had the benefit of not knowing what to do. And that benefit allowed them to reach herd immunity quicker. We watched China. We watched South Korea and said, oh, no, this is going to be like, you know, the Spanish flu where 50 million people died. So we locked down. We slowed our increase. We lengthened our, our flattening the curve, which means a longer disease process. We decided that it was worth it to drop a couple trillion dollars, go into a financial free fall. And I look in my community of Bakersfield, out of a million people, we have seven deaths. And when I call the hospital, all three of them, uh, I think they had 14 people in there with COVID, three were on vents. So I say to myself, if I were the scales of justice and we were weighing the collateral damage of COVID versus the viral illness damage of COVID, the collateral damage is much heavier. Hmm. Yeah, no question. We've been saying for a while that the cure can't be worse than the disease. Um, you mentioned herd immunity. Let me ask you about a vaccine, because I'm, I'm in your camp, obviously. I believe that you know the, the faster we can get the herd immunity, the better. It seems like that's where we all need to get to. But there's those that can talk up that want to talk about, well, we just have to wait for a vaccine, which is probably 18 months or more off. I, I go back to the flu vaccine, though, which doesn't seem to be that effective. So what are your thoughts on the vaccine as a potential versus the herd immunity thought? Well, the, you're having one of the same conversation. A vaccine takes you to herd immunity. That's the whole point. You get vaccinated, you're immune to it, and it takes you to herd immunity quicker. Now, if we look at the flu vaccine, the CDC website, again, I'm going to start just using all these quotes. The CDC says that usually the vaccine is about 30% effective in a good year. Other years, to quote the CDC, it has little to no effect on herd immunity. And a secondary fact, I see thousands of patients every week that don't want the vaccine. So now mm-hmm. you've got a vaccine that works 30% of the time, and then you've right. got maybe 40 or 50% of the population that doesn't want it. So this is not a perfect science. Does it give us herd immunity quicker? Absolutely. Is it effective? Yes, it is. But let's be careful. Read the CDC. I keep telling people, go. don't listen to me. Read the CDC. It's right on their page. It's super easy. It'll take you five minutes. And the point is, 
herd immunity is the way we get through influenza A and B every year. It's mm-hmm. a three- to four-month process. I've been watching it for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I bounce my ideas off the biostatisticians who analyze this mathematically, we are in agreement. Hmm. You, uh, Dr. Erickson, you talked about people often dying of multiple things, right? It's not – they may have um, – and I think in, the, in, the, in one of the cases you talked about, somebody died of, of smoking for 25 years, but yet he had COVID in him, so they list him as a COVID patient, right? This is happening – and this is – I have firsthand accounts for this. Do I have data to support it? We're, the data will be coming out. But, yes, people have gone into the hospital – I have a first-hand account yesterday of, of, of a friend's family member who went in after he had, he had died of, uh, he'd been, he had, I think he had lung cancer, smoking for years. He had been dying for a couple years, and they labeled it as COVID. Another, another young man I'll talk about, 23 years old, had some depression. He got laid off. Yesterday, he was taken to the hospital for a suicide attempt. Oh. Oh, he he ate, ate a bunch of pills. He's on a vent right now. And you know, you know what his diagnosis will be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. But That's sad. See, COVID, COVID causes depression, anxiety. It's causing suicide. I don't have all the numbers. These are sort of, you know, uh, these are what I've gathered after talking to colleagues in the ER, colleagues on the floor. I'm saying, what are you seeing? And they're seeing spike in alcohol use. Um, I don't have all the data for this. This is me talking to people, fellow. What are you seeing? This is the data we're seeing. So COVID is causing secondary problems, and that's what I'm calling collateral damage that's heavier in, in some ways than the virus itself. Well, what I love is you've said this repeatedly, you know, you're on the front line, right? And it would make a lot of sense to me to talk to more of folks like you who are on the front line. Right? That just makes sense. You're on the front line. You're seeing the new data. And as you and your partner have said, the data has changed, right? It, it was changing every two hours for a while, right? But the data has changed. And like us in the financial world, when the data has changed on a stock, we're going to sell it, right? When the data has changed with this, we need to move with it. Are, are you getting any uh, positive you know, feedback from like any municipalities or anywhere around the country that's saying, look, at, we're now starting to embrace some of this and we are starting to open up and we are starting to understand it a little better? Oh, I could, I could give you a list of government people. Uh, I don't know if they'd want me to list them. I was just on the phone with, I've, I've been on the phone with, uh, without hyperbole, about 20 uh, congressmen and senators who have called me and said, you're right on. Um, how do we get this thing going? We're trying to figure out. I mean, I'm trying to advise on the stuff I've learned from a medical standpoint, what is a good decision moving forward? We made a decision to lock down. I understand that two months ago. You know, the administration and Fauci said, we don't know what's coming over. Let's prepare for this. Great decision. I towed the line. I wore masks at home. I wore masks at stores. I did the whole thing. And then I looked at the data in Kern County, and I said, well, it's pretty mild here. I mean, we've got a, a, a five, six deaths out of a million people. It's pretty low. And I checked it for two months, and then I, I studied different areas and said, maybe it's time to pivot and start looking at different methods of handling this, i.e. Sweden. What do we need to do? We need to come down this ladder in a stepwise fashion, per Dr. Gisecki, chief epidemiologist, infectious disease specialist out of Sweden. Come down in a stepwise fashion, open the schools, immediately. Children do very well. They have mild disease. Watch it for two weeks. Open up businesses. Watch it for two weeks. Open up church. Watch it for two weeks. If we start to get spikes beyond our medical control, we pull back. To me, it's a simple answer. Hmm. Appreciate I, I We only have about a minute here left. I'm just going to say thank you so much, uh, Dan, uh, Dr. Erickson, for uh, stepping up and uh, letting your voice uh, be heard, because I think, uh, you know, it's really, truly very brave what you're doing. You know, we've, uh, you know, I can't imagine some of the negative stuff that has come back to you, but, you know, I know you guys have been pulled from YouTube and other places, and and I really just uh, want to tell you to continue to be brave, continue to do yeah. what you're doing, man, and we, we uh, pray for you, and I think that's great, so. Yeah, we appreciate know. it. Don't let the liberal outrage mob uh, shout you down, which yeah. unfortunately is typically uh, what they want to do when they, when they don't have a way to you know, combat or, or argue or, or debate. So yep. And uh, Glenn and I do go back here. and forth to California once in a while. we got some traders in San Diego. So when this uh, mess uh, calms down and we can come out there, we'll buy you a glass of wine or some dinner. Yeah. 
Call me anytime. All right, sir. We so you, appreciate you appreciate uh, spending some time with us here and uh, and uh, take care and um, stay safe. All right, uh, Mike Lomas, Glenn Wiggle, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue. We'll go back to the phone lines here, and I know a lot of you have been very patient. If you want to hop on board, 1-800-616-9236, 1-800-616-9236. Mike Lomas, Glenn Wiggle, the financial guys, the place where money meets politics. And if you need us throughout the week, folks, we thought, you know, we're not really talking about money today, but we thought that show was really important. We thought that interview was really important. So like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and I really encourage you to follow us on Twitter. A lot of the stuff we talk about, we post to our Facebook page. We post to Twitter. Use us as a resource, thefinancialguys.com. If you think like us, pop in and see our team. All right, real quick break, another 30 minutes to go here on the Financial Guys Radio Network. 